The researchers come here with crystals made of viruses. Each crystal contains hundreds of thousands of the same type of virus, perfectly ordered. These are crystals that are identical to those that form the minerals found in many rocks. In the chess synchrotron, Richard Gillian is the specialist in taking atomic photographs of viruses. So, it takes a very, very steady hand, but I've got one right here. The virus crystals prepared by scientists in laboratories throughout the world reach his hands. The trick is to mount it quickly. This is a very, very cold stream of nitrogen gas that freezes the sample instantly so that no ice forms. It's like a glass. The crystal is already prepared for receiving a powerful X-ray beam. Okay. Now is the moment that many researchers have been waiting for. They've spent a long time growing their crystals. They've mounted it on the beam line. And in fact, you can see one right here. It's that, that blue area is an actual crystal of a biological molecule. Uh, but before we can take a snapshot, we have to close the radiation area, which I'm going to do right now. That was a very heavy lead door that we have to put in place to protect us from the uh, extremely bright x-rays that we're about to use. So I've placed the crosshairs right on the protein crystal. I can take a snapshot of it. And within a few minutes, we get a pattern of spots. Unlike an ordinary digital camera where you have a lens and you can focus on an image, with x-rays we have no lenses. So instead, we have to shine an x-ray look at the scattered particles and we get a bunch of dots on the screen. When the x-ray hits the virus sample, it is diffracted into thousands of small x-rays. Each beam produces a point on the screen that receives the image. Each one of these points comes from a virus atom. That is how the virus is portrayed, atom by atom. Usually they bring many, many crystals. Um, the virus crystallographers may be hundreds of crystals uh, to get a single set of data from which they can extract a picture of the molecule. But um, we also are lucky sometimes. We put one crystal on, do 180, and we're done, and it works. It's uh, very much an art as much as a science. Having obtained this image of points, what the scientists really have is a tangled web of data. It requires laborious mathematical analysis, computers, a lot of people working several years to decode this web. Years to obtain, a much more recognizable image of a virus such as this one. But it is difficult to imagine what scientists see in these webs of color. Why so much investment? Why so much effort? What they have achieved with an image like this is to undress a virus and extract its secrets. Its structure tells us how it is made, how it functions, what mechanisms it uses when it infects, where and what changes so as to evolve and jump species, where it is weak, where it can be attacked. Specific medication has begun to be designed against viruses and based on their structure. A new form of fighting these agents has been born. Now everything seems to have been discovered, but no. With an electron microscope and a synchrotron, one can see through the atoms. 
but there is no technology capable of answering a basic question. Knowing whether the viruses are alive or not. They might represent another form of life unknown to us. A different concept of life, bordering on the living and the inert. Viruses, and there is no way of understanding this, can be alive and dead at the same time. They're everywhere, on the crest of a wave, in the air, on the grass. They disappear and appear at full speed. The sun destroys them, and they're created again, millions in just one second. There are those who say that if we were to put all the viruses that exist end to end, they would form a long chain that would stretch to the ends of the known universe. In number, estimates talk of an unpronounceable figure, 10 to the power of 24, that's a one followed by 24 zeros for the viruses present on Earth. By looking for them in nature and isolating them, it has been possible to recognize and classify more than 2,000 different species of virus. This is what these researchers are dedicated to. They are virus hunters. They are looking for new viruses in the plants in a jungle and in the waters of a bay in the heart of civilization in California. The researchers might find a new species of virus in these samples, one not expected in this environment. Who knows? They are hidden among other matter. One has to filter and filter the water, dissolve the leaves until one can obtain a definitive sample. The time has come, and it has happened again. The two water and plant samples are full of viruses. To date, viruses have been found in all living beings analyzed. There are more than 250,000 species of plants on the planet, and we have found that 6% of plants contain at least one type of virus. That is why we believe that more than 18,000 species of virus exist on the planet just in plants. Here what you can see on the screen is from one drop of water we collected early this morning, and in one, one drop of water you see those little green dots, they are viruses in the water. There's millions of them in that single drop of water. The larger particles you're seeing here, they are bacteria. There are also many bacteria in the water. But in general, there's 10 times more viruses in every drop of water than bacteria in the water. Most of those viruses not causing human disease to our current knowledge, but they may evolve and probably causing human problems in the future. We don't know why they do it, nor what mechanism or conditions are required for a virus, whether in nature or in an animal, to decide to evolve, to change its habitat, and to jump from one species to another. But frequently, with every new leap, it forms a new virus, and a new disease appears. This can take centuries, or just a few years, or even months, Colin Parrish has witnessed the speed with which a virus has managed to escape and jump species.